Good day everyone, this is Polly Doodles and welcome to DDO Players News, where we take a look at the latest news in DDO and on the tabletop. And please welcome my co-host from Ravenloft, Raculata. Hey now everybody, how's it going? Hello there, Drek. How are things going over in Barovia? Hot and miserable. Hot and miserable. It, it's the fault of that thing called the sun, right? Exactly. Somehow the sun has broken through the fog and the mist, and it is burying just hell upon the lands currently right now. Ugh. Sun, who needs it? We will have to find that out at some point, but I think for now we should go into our game news where we had some release notes for update 46.2.0. Three. Not much, though. Uh, no, it was a, just a tiny little, uh, I guess we'll call it a hot fix. Why not? Uh, this one was released uh, on Tuesday, June 23rd. Uh, the biggest thing this one fixed was an issue where chest ransack was not working properly. So that is now fixed. So go loot those chests to try to get uh, the loot you're looking for. Ransack is working again. Uh, also, uh, they did discover an issue where reincarnation data could become unreadable by the game after an update. Uh, this could cause epic destiny loss if a character is logged out before a patch and reincarnated after a patch. If that character has not been logged in after the same version of the game, they are reincarnated on. If reincarnation has begun and then a patch occurs... The character will be directed to log into the game prior to completing reincarnation. That is confusing. That essentially, then, they're saying it's an issue. They can't do anything about it. So the only thing they can do about it is to refuse to let you log finish your reincarnation until you log into the character. Correct. The English version is it, it'll let you know, hey, you can't reincarnate until you log in, and then that is usually after a patch, and then whatever issue that is caused is taken care of after the patch. You log back in, you can reincarnate, and all is good in the world. So there you go. Because, yeah, there was a lot of people having issues with uh, reincarnation. Uh, I haven't looked at the forums since this uh, update, so I'm not sure if uh, most of the problems people were having has been fixed, but let's uh, we'll just hope that they have. And then let's head into a slightly larger update, 46.3. Is it more substantial than the previous one? Very much so. This one uh, was released uh, just uh, this past Tuesday on June 30th. Uh, the VIP players and season pass holders are now getting a small group bonus to experience. Uh, this uh, they did announce a couple weeks back. The bonus is per person in the party other than yourself and hirelings and provides a plus one XP boost per party member in your raid group for a maximum bonus of a plus five bonus for a party and plus 11 for a raid group. A note, as I said, this bonus is not applied for hirelings or other NPC companions in your group. Uh, the good thing is this bonus will stack with other boosts to XP. Those are including the uh, weekend XP bonuses, the DDO store elixirs, the buddy boost weekends. Uh, this is in addition to the standard plus 10 XP provided to VIP players. So that's pretty cool. So if you're, you know, playing with three people, uh, you're going to get plus three xp on top of your plus 10 which is nice and then on top of any other bonuses you have going so that's kind of well, cool for me, well for me it's probably usually going to be just a plus one percent well yeah <laughs> because yeah you usually only ever play with me so yeah so um, ours is not going to be that great, but, you know, if you play with more people, then it'll be greater, but that's kind of cool. Also, uh, in the update, they corrected a non-visible issue in underlying Sentinel that was causing an impact on game performance, i.e. lag fix. Corrected a non-visible issue with feeding and draining effects that were causing an impact to performance, i.e. lag corrected a non-visible issue uh oh i just uh, read that one sorry uh also the correct hardcore server reward npc is now located in its proper location throughout the hardcore server 
that's There's always handy. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the one from the first season right. um, wasn't Harry from last season. It was Mortality, I think, was the one that was okay. showing up. And it should be the Archon, which it is now corrected. So that is all good. A uh, bunch of typos and grammar issues have been corrected uh, within the Hardcore Rewards NPC. The Hardcore Reward, you notice a Hardcore um, theme going on here. The Hardcore Reward NPC now grants Season 1 and 2 rewards on the Hardcore server for those players who, of course, earned them during Season 1 and 2. And death messages are now displaying properly on the hardcore server. Yes. I noticed that Cordifin during his lunch stream today, there was a lot of discussion relating to death messages. That they're wondering what is the best rate at which to show them minimum level or something like this because some people are annoyed when you have all these hardcore server death messages come up. Yeah, and I guess they changed the way they displayed now or something. I don't know. I was kind of, yeah. I kind of glanced over a thread and I'm like, yeah, I don't really care about hardcore yeah, that much to channel. read it. But. They changed the channel that it's coming from. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. Then let's head to our chronicle for this week where someone has a big axe. That is a big axe. That is a very, very big axe. Pretty sweet looking axe. I usually don't use axes on my characters, but that's a pretty sweet looking axe. Okay, so it's a giant axe. It makes it a Gygax. Moving right along in our <laughs> chronicles. I, I got nothing for that. Finally. Nothing whatsoever for you for that. In the community spotlights, wow, by the uh, the Flaming Spear Scroll fan club thread has now entered into the Hall of Fame. So click over for that thread. Just, I was going to try to explain this thread, and I can't do it justice. Just go click over on the Chronicle and read this. Uh, it's a good read, and you'll laugh a lot, and this deserved to be in the Hall of Fame. So congratulations. Did you even know we had a Hall of Fame for forum post, Pine Lane? You probably didn't I even realize did that, did you? Not. Yeah. Yes. Only the best of the best can make it into the Hall of Fame. So you strive to do good post on the forums to get into the elusive Hall of Fame. Uh, there is a couple uh, hardcore videos out there for you. Strim Tom uh, created a new video to get you ready for the new hardcore season with some possible builds. Samus Garobo uh, created a video of his top five builds uh, for the new season of Hardcore. Uh, over in the Guild Hall, the Easily Distracted Gaming Community recently celebrated its first anniversary. This group operates their own Discord, excuse me, their own Discord, and they also help organize runs on uh, any server and among many different guilds. So click over to check out the Easily Distracted Gaming Community. If you have a, a guild that you would like to uh, get featured in the Chronicle, uh, send that to contact at sandingstonegames.com with the subject line Guild Hall, and your guild might be featured as well. Over in the uh, fansite news section, DDOcast uh, is discussing new and returning players. That is episode 603 for them. Click over to give that a watch or a listen. Uh, don't forget uh, DDO stream uh, over on Twitch. Lots of people uh, playing DDO. DDO PL is playing a pirate alchemist. Alex and Lynn uh, heads into Barovia. Hmm, I didn't notice them in town. I'll have to pay attention. And the damsels of DDO are continuing their year of epics. Uh, elsewhere on Twitch, uh, Canal Do Beholder. Uh, yeah, okay. Let's try, <laughs> let's try that again. Canal Do Beholder. Kalaho? Uh, see. See, Kalo. Uh, uh, is this in Portuguese? Or I'm not or? sure. This is a new one on me. I will have to check it out. I'm not sure. Anyway, check out the Doobie Holder. Yeah. We'll just say that. Yeah, it looks like, yeah, based on the channel, it looks like 
yeah, it looks like Portuguese. Yes, he'll still be a uh, canal do beholder of uh, Calo. It's, yeah, it, it's Portuguese. Canal is definitely channel of. See, I, mean, I wonder if Calo is Portuguese for I, perhaps. I wonder. So oh, wonder. that's an interesting question. Channel okay. of the beholder eye. Of the eye of the beholder, I guess. The eye of the beholder. Oh, uh, that, okay. That's that's a guess, of course, for because beholder of and channel are obvious enough it's that fourth word which well well is a guess but it well check like them out over about, on twitch uh, beholders <laughs> well there you go it comes to my mind you know? <laughs> and apparently it's probably going to be in portuguese so you have been warned uh, yeah. geek gaming dragon also has uh is playing dd over on twitch and don't forget about voodoo spice and uh, his videos as well youtube is another place to check out uh, ddo players playing ddo and making videos uh, alex has a new video up uh, talking about the new hardcore league x queen of heart x does a blind let's play and ddo jano does a reaper seven grim and barrett run and I'm assuming I haven't watched these videos yet. Uh, I usually try to watch these videos before I talk about them. But I'm guessing X Queen of Hearts X in the Blind Let's Play is they did a quest they've never done before is what I would assume they mean by blind. I don't think they're actually blind and playing. But I could be wrong. That would make it very challenging. Yes, I think it would. And, of course, don't forget Mickey talking about rating over in her latest blog. We have a chronicle comment. Of course, instead of cakes, what food item should be used for resurrection? Instead of cakes? Resurrection? Yes, you know how we have the, the yeah, 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 so re resurrection to... cakes. So instead of resurrection cakes, we need a blank of resurrection. Can't think of anything that would be more appropriate. So I'm going to say an ale because that would be easier to like if you if your your teammate falls and is dead and you want to bring them back to life it's kind of hard to shove that cake in their mouth it'd be okay. easier just you, you to pour some liquid there. so yeah so we need an ale of resurrection ale of resurrection all right and you know ale so you know i mean come on it, it helps for what ails you <laughs> yeah. wow that's two for two finally you are just full of the puns tonight the screenshot of the week is uh, X Honeyol mounts up in the 469th studio screenshot of the week. That is a pretty sweet screenshot. Of course, they're mounting up on their horse. I'm guessing that's in the, the uh, giant hold. I do believe is where that is at. Almost positive that's from the giant hold. That's a cool screenshot, though. So good job on the screenshot. And that is our chronicle this week and the an answer for what we were discussing earlier looks like Callow's translation is one-eyed so therefore that'll be the channel of the one-eyed beholder interesting would be, would be the english translation i'll have to check that channel out i'll have to watch some of his video on demands and check that out right just remember though it's likely to be in portuguese, <laughs> in portuguese that's right well i watched DDOPL, and I don't understand where they're saying, but they're entertaining, well, okay. so, you, you know. You do have a point there. Yeah. You do watch DDOPL. It's all in the entertainment, Pine Leaf. Okay, it's all in the entertainment. Then uh, let's head into and see what's coming in from the dungeon. Icewind Dale Rhyme of the Frost Maiden is the next 5e book for DDO. Is uh, for yeah for Dungeons and Dragons, and that sounds like a chilly one. 
It is. I'm excited. This, um, I've always loved Icewind Dale. Uh, never really I'm trying to think back in my tabletop days. I had a DM that kind of did one thing at Icewind Dale, maybe. So more of my uh, familiarity with Icewind Dale is, of course, the Icewind Dale video games. But yes, uh, D&D 5E sourcebook taking us to Icewind Dale. They say some secrets are worth dying for. Feel the cold touch of death in this adventure for the world's greatest role-playing game. I love how they call D&D 5e the world's greatest role-playing game. I'm looking at this. This thing on the front cover looks like a cross between a owlbear and a ram. That's a good... And then there's that really nasty-looking uh, wolf there, too. But yes, uh, let's see where was I? The Feel the Cold Touch of Death. Uh, an Icewind Dale adventure is a dish... A dish best served cold beneath the unyielding night sky you stand before a towering glacier and recite an ancient rhyme you cause a crack to form in the great wall of ice beyond this yawning fissure the caves of hunger await and past this icy dungeon is a secret so old and terrifying that few dare speak of it the mad wizards of the arcane brotherhood long to possess that which the god of winter's wrath has so coldly preserved, and so do you. With fantastic secrets and treasures are entombed in the sunless heart of the glacier, and what will you discover and what will your discovery mean for the denizens of Icewind Dale? Can you save the ten towns from the Frost Maiden's everlasting night? Icewind Dale, the rhyme of the Frost Maiden, is a tale of dark terror that revisits the forlorn, the flickering candlelights of civilization. Notice the ten towns and it shed lights on many bone chilling locations surrounding those frontier settlements so this sounds pretty cool actually i'm kind of excited about this one sounds pretty frigid yeah it's uh gonna be very cold and it's a horror driven which is kind of interesting that they're going back to uh a, a horror storyline uh, the storyline is revolving around ariel the frost maiden has she has withdrawn to a cold corner to live among the mortals and she hides from the gods that are trying to kill her as the divine embrace embodiment of winter's fury she has cast a spell over the realm and has plagued it into a perpetual dark winter rhyme of the frost maven frost maiden revisits the frontier settlements uh, that are known as ten towns and players try to stray a step ahead of the mad wizards of the arcane brotherhood uh, just like uh, all the uh, other source books that have came out, uh, there's going to be two covers to this. There's going to be the standard cover, and then there's going to be the limited edition uh, alternate cover uh, that is only going to be available at your friendly local game stores. Uh, both books are going to retail for $49.95 at launch, and this is due to come out on September the 12th. Sounds interesting. I'm excited about this. Uh, I'm positive. Tim will get this to review. Usually Watsy sends all the books for review. So uh, look for a review of this coming soon, probably, to the site. And hopefully I'll get to you uh, run this uh, as well, because I'm kind of excited about this one. Also in the news from the dungeon, artist Jim Holloway, who has asked... Yeah, he has been, I'm not sure if we've talked about it on the podcast at all. I think maybe I made a post about it a long, long time ago. I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast, though. But uh, he has been uh, sick for quite a while, unfortunately. Uh, he has had uh, cancer. And his son did uh, make an announcement over on the Art of Jim Holloway uh, Facebook group page that uh, on Sunday he did uh, unfortunately uh, pass away. Uh, he was surrounded by uh, his family at the time i guess it was a peaceful pass passing so that's good uh very very sad you might not necessarily know the name jim holloway um i'm hoping most people listen to this podcast uh if you played older editions of the game you do know the name if not i guarantee you you've seen the artwork he has done a lot of artwork for a lot of the the classic mod modules uh and also uh some of the inside work as well he did the cover for the dungeon land uh module that's the one that i think most people might know him for uh he also did uh some uh tolkien paintings as well which i put one of them up in the post uh, i also linked down
down uh, in the bottom of the post, if you scroll and keep scrolling and keep scrolling, it lists all of the art that he's done. Uh, if you just look over this, I guarantee you there's a lot of this stuff you're going to go, oh yeah, I I know that art piece, or I know that book cover. So yeah, you will definitely know uh, Jim's art, and uh, just uh, wanna you know just send out thoughts to all you know his family during this time. And uh, sorry to hear of his passing, but uh, at least his art will always live on. And let's head over to the tabletop. like is that you have a little unboxing of Scooby-Doo's Betrayal? That's right. We talked about this. Oh, it's been a while since we talked about this, but yeah, it's a Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Manson. It is Betrayal at House on the Hill with a Scooby-Doo theme thrown on top of it. So it's Scooby-Doo. How does Betrayal fit? It's just like Betrayal. You're building out the mansion. You're going to the mansion. And then once you trigger the haunt, one person in your party is going to become the villain and is going to play the monsters. So you're going to have that yeah. traitor aspect. Yeah, but I, I don't know. It just doesn't sound like it fits a Scooby-Doo. You know, that's... I, a lot of people are saying that. Uh, there was some people that commented over on the video of that as well. And I posted about this over on the Scooby-Doo Reddit. And there was a lot of people that brought that up. It's like, you know, I like Betrayal at House on the Hill. I love Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo, people don't turn on each other. So I, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, so yeah, basically I just did an unboxing of this. I was... Spoil I call this spoiler light because I did show off s the tiles. And I know when I did, I think it was the Betrayal at Baldur's Gate uh, unboxing that I did. Some people complained that I showed the titles because they're like, hey, that's a spoiler for the game. So I called it a spoiler light. I did not go over the haunts. I showed the book. I showed a quick, if you watch the video, I opened up a random haunt page and you saw it for like a half a second and then that's all i showed so i didn't i'm not spoiling any of that in my review i'm not going to spoil any of that as well either because that's half the fun of betrayal is the haunts that trigger randomly and you don't know how they trigger it just happens during the game and then of course one person becomes you know the the traitor and then they're going against the rest of the group so i'm excited to check this out uh the scooby-doo theme is very very well done uh just from the unboxing that i did you can really tell uh, this is Scooby-Doo. It's like all of the the haunts that you play through, there is, I think, 25 of them. They're all based off classic cartoon episodes, which I thought was amazing. So I can't wait to actually get this to the table. So look at a review uh, for this sometimes. Once again, I'm going to keep the review spoiler free. Try to. I got to figure out how to do. A I got to look back and see how I reviewed the other betrayal games and see how we did those spoiler free and try to do the same thing. So, but yeah, so check this out if you want to see what the game looks like with a spoiler light because you do see the tiles. Just a little spoiler light warning for you. Then let's turn to the screen. where it looks like there's a Beavis reboot. There is. Beavis and Butthead are coming back, and I'm so excited, which a lot of people are going to be like, what, what, what? You're excited? Because normally when they when we talk about reboots on this, I'm like, you know, get off my lawn, you know? But no, <laughs> this, is, this is exciting because they're doing it right this time. The iconic cartoon Beavis and Butthead are going to return, but not to MTV. It's coming to Comedy Central this time. Uh, they did announce uh, today that they uh, signed an exclusive expansive deal with the Enemy Award winning, or an Emmy Award winning, let me 
say that correctly, Mike Judge, and he's going to reimagine the MTV seminal Gen X defining Beavis and Butthead cartoon. So creator Mike Judge has signed on. It is going to be Mike Judge that is going to do this. He is going to write it. He's going to produce it. And he's also going to provide the voiceovers, of course, for Beavis and Butthead, just like the original. This is amazing. I cannot wait for this. I am so excited. You could not do Beavis and Butthead without Mike Judge. So that is the most important part of this. That's why I'm actually excited for a reboot for once. Write this day down on the calendar. It's probably not going to happen very often. Often. And Mike Judge uh, did say it just seemed like the right time to get this stupid thing going again. So there you go. Uh, in the new iteration, Beavis and Butthead are entering a whole new Gen Z world. Comedy Central ordered two seasons of the new series uh, with meta themes relatable to both new and old fans and their Gen X parents and their Gen Z kids. Uh, Once again, no release date has been announced, uh, but we will be sure to talk about it. Uh, The last season of Beavis and Butthead was back in 2011. Uh, That did air on uh, MTV, and that did receive praise uh, from both longtime and new fans as well. So I'm excited. I am confident, since my Mike Judge is involved in this. It's going to pull off and it's going to be just like the classic Beavis and Buttheads and it's going to be amazing and I can't wait and let's just get this thing going now. And I bet Pine Leaf has never seen one episode of Beavis and Butthead ever. Bingo! (laughs) Do you even, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of Beavis and Butthead, right? I believe I have vague memories of trying not to think about that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, somehow I figured that, but yeah, I am super excited about this. And if I mention the word Cornholio, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. I am Cornholio! I need TV for my bunghole! (laughs) Senor Beavis, ¿dónde está tu hall pass? Are you threatening me? (laughs) You will give me TV, bungholio! (laughs) Beavis, just what in the hell do you think you're doing? Do not make my bunghole angry! (laughs) Do you have any olio? Get the hell out of my class and go straight to the principal's office, now! Um, okay. The principal, he will give me TP. I would hate for my bungolio to get polio. <sighs> Las luces han prendidas y nadie en casa. Where I come from, we have no bunghole. So yes, look for that coming soon. Like I said, we'll, I'm sure I'll post about this. I'm sure we'll get little teasers and all sorts of stuff. So I'll look for uh, some more Beavis and Butthead news soon because I am super excited. And I know, like, the whole world is just cute because I'm excited about a reboot. I, I don't know how to feel about this because, you know, in the past, I've rallied against a lot of reboots. But I'm actually excited about this one, which not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> how you feel about being excited about a reboot. Right, exactly. Then let's enter our weekend gaming. Drek, what were you up to? Okay, we are officially going to rename this this segment. It's, <laughs> it, it is going to be called the Pine Leaf Week in Gaming from now on. Uh, because, yeah, um, if you've listened to the past couple shows, I didn't do anything. Uh, kind of a combination between uh, I'm just stupid busy and I have some, I have some personal issues going on medical related i'll just leave it at that i mean it's nothing like life threatening or anything like that but it's enough to where it's kind of interfering with my gaming life and my life in general uh which also ergo kind of interferes with the podcast so that's why we didn't have an episode last week and going on in the future if we go every other week uh that's why i'm sorry about that uh trying to get all this straightened out i'm not going to go into all the details but anyway just so yeah uh, i apologize that I'm the cause of the delay of the podcast. So if we don't have a podcast one week, it's always because of me. Like good old Pine Leaf is like always ready to do a Pine. Uh, uh, I almost said a Pine Leaf cast. That's funny. 
<laughs> Pine Leaf is always ready to do a podcast. Like and like for example, Pine Leaf. If you listen to the other podcast that is on our network, Lotro Players News, Pine Leaf, I do believe has been on every episode of Lotro Players News from day one. Yeah, that's amazing, Pine Leaf. So Pine Leaf is the true professional here on on on, on, on this podcast because he is always ready to go, and I'm the one that's saying, "Nope, can't do a podcast this week because of this, because of this." So. I apologize for that, folks. It's always my fault. But yeah, so I didn't do anything. The only thing I did that was semi-gaming relating was I made that video for the Scooby-Doo uh, Mystery Mansion game. So I guess that was my week in gaming, question mark? And then I'll go over with what I did. Well, not much in DDO itself. I just created my wizard because who's going to be my July Borderlands character created the wizard and ran the grotto in there it looks like looks like the wizard is going to be a very tough character <laughs> to get through yeah i one. bet i bet oh <laughs> uh, yeah i am go how i've gotten through the last couple of ones some of them to my surprise with, without a cleric there is absolutely no way in the world that the wizard's going to get through without a cleric i think i'll be lucky to get through with the cleric we'll have to see maybe i'll have to Instead of a cleric. It's always good to have that pocket instead. cleric, probably. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's what... But I created the character, and I think it was the roughest grotto run I remember having. So that's what happened in there. Then in Minecraft, I finished my MHC for June on the Skyblock thing and managed to survive through all that. And Mage Rages. Got through week three and four. Now, week number four was right after the Nether update was launched. Thus, it was the first Mage Rage to be done under 1.16, which meant, of course, we were sent to the Nether to collect some of those nifty new items that are going to be found found there since they completely overhauled the Nether for 1.16. Then in Minecraft Dungeons, my lower level character ran the Redstone Mines, and my higher level character ran the first dungeon in the new Jungle DLC. Jungle DLC came out today. Day, so I ran the first one in there, and it was a. It took me something like forty or fifty minutes in order to get through there, so that was a pretty long dungeon. So I have to make sure that when I play some of these later ones, that I've got plenty of time allocated before I do it. Because some of the earlier ones could take a lot, take a relatively short amount of time. So later ones. Now in my Minecraft world, my season two on that, I had decided not to go to the Nether. During season two, thinking that what I'll do is I'll save the Nether for when they do the Nether update, and then I'll do everything that I need. so. Just wait off for the Nether. I'm not going to go to the Nether. I'm not going to get any advantage of anything for the Nether throughout throughout that world, and I'll just continue season the Win.16, stay in the same world without any trouble in there. And I got into that world after the Nether update, and it was the most underwhelming. Nether, you could possibly produce under 1.16. That's what I gotta say about that. It was just this big, expansive soul sand valley. And I was saying, really? And I decided to create a new world anyway. So I created my new world in there, and I'm starting on my tower, which I'm putting right at the zero coordinates for the world. So there's no way in the world I can lose this because my starting point. I got my initial base. It's going to be a tower, which make it easy to see. And even if I can lose that tower somehow, it's at coordinates 0.0, .0 which has got to be the easiest coordinates to find in Minecraft. And I'll probably somehow get lost anyway. Sure. Then over on the tabletop, I played Mystic Veil Nemesis, and I finally was able to beat the easiest of the nemesis that we have there which means that i have to see if i could get the next one as they start going progressively tougher as you go along and face each of them in one deck dungeon my archer failed to kill the dragon i'm not too sure i've ever figured out how to play the archer and based on some of the forms over at board game i have the feeling that i'm not alone in that where the archer can be very tough to play because the archer has a lot of trouble managing time because your ability to get black dice, which are the wild dice, is based on giving up time. And of course, if you give up time, you eventually run out of time, is what often happens if, you're not, if you do it too much. Then I played Friday, and this time I was testing Friday to see how 
to try play it on the gaming table, see how it fits on there. Of course, that pretty easily because Friday has a relatively small footprint, and that went pretty well. But I decided that because of what happened when I played on the app a couple of weeks ago, I said, "All right, I'll play it at level two. Is it okay, okay? Level two is perhaps I should have played it at level three instead because that was a little bit too easy. I don't know how I got killed in level one a couple of weeks ago on the app because I just breeze through level two cards here. Then on Nautilian, it was a pretty close race there, but I was one turn late and one crew member short at the end of the game. I didn't quite finish that over there. D space D6, I had a very close battle with, uh, with the Ouroboros and managed to just squeeze by a win on that one. Then on Nyrim, Nyrim started out with some pretty bad draws in there, but I managed to mitigate on there. I think I have base game Nyrim pretty well at hand, it looks like. I wish I could say the same thing about Arian, where I was just completely smashed to pieces. Then Bethel Woods. Now, what I'm doing is I'm taking a lot of the games that I have and playing and testing them out on the gaming table, which is why I have such a wide variety of games that I was playing last week. And when you say gaming table, you're talking about your actual game table that you have now. Right, right, yes, that one. Okay. Yes, because I'm I'm trying to take all my favorite games and seeing how they work on the gaming table, and, and of course, yes, well, better than they were working on some of the other places. That's what that's what it seems like. Bethel. Now, the thing about Bethel Woods is my biggest trouble I've had with that game is sometimes keeping my concentration on the game and getting distracted. But since my gaming table is in a completely different room from the things that usually distract me <laughs> when I'm playing a game, I didn't get distracted any. So I was able to actually make a plan in there. And, and even though the game was being rather nasty to me in a few places, I actually managed to squeeze off a, a win there. And I think being able to concentrate because I don't have any distractions will help that one. Then in Warfighter, I had a sniper hunt. And I started off with these annoying ambushers that were just pinning me in place and just trying to get past them. Eventually, it did, I did get past them and move on, but I was really pressed for time at the very, very end. And I just had the perfect card combination in order to do what I did. And that was to, that's right, I found a, I think I found some canteens just at the next to the last turn, just before going in. I I was, I was used that to get some extra cards, and I was able to sneak into the private thing, being able to not be noticed by anyone, so that I could just chuck a grenade at our sniper and was able to squeeze off a win that way. Now, my reason for playing Warfighter here was I decided, in addition to testing out it on testing it on the table, was to see if I could play with two-player soldiers with the table, because in the past I've always played with one player soldier. I've always avoided playing two player soldiers. Usually all the rest of my soldiers I had were NPC type soldiers, those that don't have cards. And I'm hoping to get into some longer and some larger scenarios now that I have a gaming table. If I do that, I'm going to need multiple player soldiers if that's going to work. So that's why I was experimenting playing with two player soldiers to see how that works. So that seems to be able to work in this case. Then Tiny Epic Galaxies, where I decided to play normal with the expansion. And what I found here is that normal with the expansion is a lot tougher than normal. When I say normal, I mean normal difficulty than normal without the expansion. Because last time I played normal without the expansion, I just killed the AI. And this time, normal with the expansion, I got clobbered. And it was because I was not getting the expansion stuff quite right. So, so I had to play. A, at an easy setting next time and see how that runs. Now, I'm sure you've heard all the buzz recently about a little thing called Jaws of the Lion. Yes. Yes. So, of course, hearing all this buzz about Jaws of the Lion percolated Gloomhaven in there. Now, at first I was thinking, well, why do I not to think not to think about Jaws of the Lion? I mean, I had no trouble playing Gloomhaven as it is. Why would I need another Gloomhaven thing? Then I was hearing some of the reviews on it, especially from people who had trouble getting Gloomhaven to the table? Yeah, yeah. I watched a couple of videos and I'm like, ooh, maybe I'll get Jaws of Lion and play that and then I'll actually get Gloomhaven. I, I still keep looking at my Gloomhaven box and yes, I'm like, that... one day, one day, 
Yes, that's the thing with 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 Gloomhaven there. And as I'm saying there, yes, that sort of like was a little bit of an inspiration there, is because Jaws of the Lion. Well, first off, it teaches you how to play Gloomhaven in in a series of scenarios, so that by the end of scenario five, you have the full game. But they teach you the basics first, and the next scenario they teach you more, 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 so that. You don't have it because in the original Gloomhaven, they throw everything at you in, in scenario one. And in scenario two, they give you everything. And on top of that, they had a boss fight. Yeah, that, that's how they'll start someone up who's trying. <laughs> yeah. So when Jaws the Lion, they try to take it a little bit more at an easier learning curve on that. And in fact, I was watching someone do their playthrough on, on the first few episodes of Jaws of Life to remind me of how Gloomhaven operates. So that's why I was, so of course, by the time I had decided maybe I should get Jaws of the Lion, it was of course completely sold out at just by any target that's within 100 miles of where I live. So I, Yeah, so I same, same thing happened to me too. I looked and I'm like, yeah, of course it's sold out. Yeah. So what I decided to do then was to pull out my Gloomhaven box. Since there are two reasons I have been playing with the Gloomhaven box. One of them is, of course, the setup time, which is, of course, the problem some people have with Gloomhaven. And the other one was, of course, table space. Now that I had the table space thing, I was able to get it out on the table and everything was able to fit in there. So, and I played the first scenario because the first scenario, the last time I tried playing the first scenario, I had squeak by a win just to notice immediately afterwards that I did not handle movement for the archers properly. And I think I only won because of that. So I decided to consider it a DQ and, and say that I lost it instead. So therefore I treated it as, as having a loss. So this time I played in this time, played it with the correct rules and all there, at least as well. There's no way in the world you could play your early few games of Gloomhaven without one or two goose, but that's inevitable. But I was able to do it without any major catastrophe type errors in there. So I finished out the first scenario properly, and then I played the second scenario, and that one went where one of my characters was exhausted, and the other one had only two cards left, meaning this was the last turn, because there's no because there's no recovering on, on that matter, because after the turn after you have only two cards left total is you're you're going to go exhausted. So this was the last turn in there. I had this living corpse that was had two hit points left. I was like, all right. All throughout that run, I kept on drawing nulls. Now this particular one had you have some curses thrown in your deck, so I can understand why I was constantly throwing nulls. But I also felt like that even when I wasn't drawing the cursed cards, I felt like my deck was cursed. You know, random number generator. And so here of course. Are, yeah. Right. So here we are. <laughs> so here we are on the last turn. I'm looking at what I have in my hand. And one of them was I had the crag cart and I had a skill that allowed me to, where you do damage to whoever's next to you, you move, and then you do one point of damage to anyone who's next to you there. So what I did is, of course, I moved next to the last living corpse in there. I did that one point of damage to it, so it was down to one point of damage. So I then make my attack. It was a, I think it was four or three. He was down to one. You're saying, oh, this happened in the bag, right? With the number of nulls I had drawn during, I think I had already gotten rid of all my curses by this point. So, so I think all I had left was that one null that I can't get rid of. So I'm pulling this card wearing, all right, am I going to pull another null at the end? I don't think there's ever been a Gloomhaven player who's ever been so happy to see a negative one pop up on a Battle draw. Okay, negative one is enough to win <laughs> because I needed three minus one is two, which is right. Good. I killed that thing finally. So math I, for the win. Math for the win. Yes. So I managed to go and win that one, but that was quite quite an episode in there, and I expect that in the next couple of weeks in there I'll get some more Gloomhaven out onto the table. But of course, as I said, I wanted to get all of my top games and well, actually gloomhaven did not start the week as on my top area but it, it sort of moved up 80 places as a result of that so, <laughs> because i'm able to finally get it and play it and understand the game so i'm really enjoying gloomhaven there then i decided to play marvel champions and i played let's see oh yeah captain marvel versus rhino that was sort of like i just 
I felt like I was stampeding on top of the rhino, is what it felt like that I was doing there. It is a real slugfest, back and forth, back and forth there, and I... So it actually turned out to be a rather... felt like a straightforward win on my side for that particular one. But, and I'm not as impressed, but I guess probably this is right after playing Gloomhaven, is that I say, okay, Gloomhaven's a better game than Marvel Champions. <laughs> well, yeah, but... <laughs> yeah. If Marvel Champions that... is, is good, though, but... Yeah, is that well, and... like... What? That, but well, they're kind of two different games too, though. True. true. I mean, it's kind of hard to like put both of them together and say which one is the better game because they're t- different games. Yeah. But I can see why after just playing Gloomhaven and playing that, you would say mm, Gloomhaven. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Then I played a couple of Roland Rights cartographers and Welcome to and on Welcome to I played the Summer Score Sheet. So that was my first time playing that particular variant there and i decided to go for large amount of ice because i was doing the summer sheet for the first time i decided to do a heavy ice cream strategy that one which meant i did very very well on the ice cream side which made up for not doing so well on the other fronts because the other fronts were had paid a little as a result of that then for tabletop apps the other thing that brought gloomhaven into my mind was that there was a major update to the app version of Gloomhaven. It's still in early access and they decided to dump the old adventure mode and they replaced it with something called Guildmaster mode where you're essentially the Guildmaster who is controlling these and you're the Guildmaster in charge of the various heroes and sending them out on missions and of course you are playing as the you do to control the heroes of course when they're inside in there. And how you interact with the characters and selecting characters in there, you buy your stuff for the gift to, donations to the temple in order to get some blessed cards and all this stuff. You're really interacting with these characters in the same way you do in Gloom, in the board in the cardboard edition for this. Now you are doing this through I'm not sure sure whether they're random missions or if they are or if they have this pool of missions or anything. I don't know exactly how they go about on selecting missions on there or if it, if I do play another guild master run later on, is it gonna be different? Is it the same or what I don't know how that is in there. But how what they do is they have you opening up the trade routes and it's these opening these trade routes by winning dungeons that helps to bring in more items being available and, and all the things that you need. Now, it only, it currently supports the six starter characters that you have cardboard edition. Now, I'm thinking that the other characters are going to be unlocked through campaign mode because there's, because I don't think there's any way right now in an adventure, at least not at this time, to unlock the other characters, but I think they're going to be unlocked through campaign mode. It looks like campaign mode is not being released until 1.0 when it goes out of early access and i'll have to see whether camp i don't know whether campaign mode is supposed to be a new campaign or if it's supposed to be the campaign original board game in there but as i've been playing it it looks like it's been feeling a lot more like gloomhaven than it was the last time i talked about it when it was before this update so if you haven't played the gloomhaven app recently they've made a lot of changes to it yeah, I've been uh, reading that and I've been watching some uh, YouTube videos on it. So yeah, I'm excited to actually update mine and yeah. play it because this looks like it's going to be uh, much better and kind of, in my opinion, how it should have been from day one. Well, I have a feeling it's probably, well, yes, they they did choose this based on feedback and stuff like that. So you do. Now, it is hard to say whether or not they could have had this full link because the tutorial they have now is a much longer tutorial than the original. The original tutorial, I think, was maybe like two dungeons worth or one worth. Then they throw you into the fray. And here, they make sure that you have a tutorial for every single one of those six characters so that you understand how they operate. And every two of them, then they have a dungeon with those two characters working together so that you can see how the character can interface with another one of the characters. Right. Yeah, so they make yeah that's sure, awesome. Yeah. Now, it takes a very long time to do that. But at least you could do it in more than one session. Because I think it took me three or three or four sessions in order to get through that entire tutorial. So that worked in there. So I had a lot of fun doing that. In fact, I've gotten through all the tutorial and I've gotten through about five or six adventures already after the tutorial. And I've gotten two of the characters up to level two. But I thought in order to get me to learn the other characters, I'm now going through the next couple of dungeons with two characters 
with a couple of the other characters that are in there. I think the only two characters that I haven't run a dungeon with yet are the two that I'm playing on the cardboard version. Oh, okay. Yeah, because, well, since I already have some experience on how they operate, so I'm just trying to make sure that I understand, because the Mind Thief and the Scoundrel are the two I'm operating with right now. And I'm doing those two because those are the ones that I'm least familiar with. Right. Yeah. So that way I have some idea to it. So when I start to get to them, and I have to unlock a couple of more, I think, villages before I can go and start doing the relic quests. I think the relic quests are the key thing you're trying to do, in, but I don't know yet because I haven't gotten that far yet. So I think I'm going to have a lot of fun with the Gloomhaven app and maybe with the cardboard version. And I'm not too sure I would have said that two weeks ago. <laughs> We currently have 14 supporters on Patreon, and if you'd like to help support TDO players, you could go to the e donations page for to support the Players Alliance on Patreon. There you'll find rewards, including a and generally podcast choice, or even be guess what the episode of We have got to change this donation section. <laughs> well, Sorry. you rewrite it how you want it written. Yeah, because... Yes, because I ha I rewrote it on the Lotro Players News. Well, there you go. Right Do there. it. Yes, okay. Re Rewrite it to make it pinely friendly. All right, let, let, let me try this one time. We currently have 14 supporters on Patreon, and if you'd like to help support Patreon, you go to the donations page on DDO Players. Is this money is used to help in our podcast hosting, website hosting, and to pay for our live shows. If you would prefer to make a donation directly to Draculetta without going through Patreon, you can send that to drac at ddoplayers.com. We did not receive any emails this week, but if you like since when you can send it to DDO Players Podcast at ddoplayers.com and you can also follow us on Twitter at the Players Alliance at Players Ally, DDO Players at DDO Players, Draculetta at Dracula and Score 72, and finally Pet Pony Needles. You can also follow Draco at Twitch on Dracula underscore 72, but I have a feeling he hasn't had much time to do Twitch late. The Players Alliance has three shows on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. We have DDO Players News on Saturdays at 8, 30 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. We have Lotro Players News, and you could follow at XP Quest on Twitter to know when XP Quest goes live, but just be careful, XP Quest is not. And you can join us for our shows at ddoplayers.com slash live. And that is all for tonight, and this is Pilot Noodles reminding you to socialize responsibly.